Hi, uh, welcome to our class this afternoon of creating a fall vegetable garden. Uh, my name is George Sesney. I'm a North Fulton Master Gardener, and I'm going to be taking you through uh, the wonderful world of gardening in the fall in the state of Georgia. Um, I've been a master gardener here in Georgia for about 12 years, and I started gardening probably when I was three or four, because my dad used to tell me I'd run out in the garden and pull those onions out of the ground and eat them. So I was into gardening as a very young person. Uh, through high school, I did it to uh, make money, also did some landscaping, and then I came here in 1976. Uh, I started gardening in the state of Georgia and learning how it's different than it is up in New York. During that time, I've done a lot of volunteer work. I have uh, worked in community gardens. I've worked up at the Chattahoochee Nature Center where we grow food for many of the local food banks. Our garden up there is about a quarter acre and we grow about 10,000 pounds of produce a year. So uh, I think I've got a fair amount of experience and hopefully that'll uh, come through. I'm gonna try to teach you this afternoon. Okay, this is our agenda for the hour we'll be together. Uh, sustainable gardening principles, uh, we'll talk about those. <clears throat> and basically we're gonna go through how to build a garden and for Georgia, how to manage it for fall vegetable gardening, uh, what you do at the end of the fall season when you get ready for spring, uh, and then we'll go through some specific cool season vegetables so you have an idea of what you can plant and how you can plant it. I'd like to spend some time on conventional versus organic gardening. <clears throat> there is a lot of pros and cons uh, on, on each side. There's a lot of people who want one way, a lot of people want the organic way. So what are your perceptions of conventional gardening? Is it a lot of chemicals? Is it a lot of sprays? Is it a lot of fertilizer? And what's your perception of organic gardening? Is it a lot of backbreaking work because you can't use the chemicals? Uh, a lot of bad harvest because the bugs get into it? Uh, and basically, where those two meet are what we call sustainable gardening. And sustainable gardening combines the best of organic and conventional, and it basically develops on what you think works for your garden. There are no specific rules, there are no required practices, it's just the balance that you see in your own garden and how that combination is gonna work for you. So what is sustainable gardening? It's a way of having your garden and getting a great yield out of it while the health of your garden and your soil is maintained and there is little or no negative impact on the environment. Uh, this is a lot different than what I would call um, industrial gardening or, or corporate gardening, where you see pictures of fields of the same vegetable uh, being sprayed by airplanes with this fog of pesticides uh, where they <clears throat> don't try to improve the soil. They just keep throwing fertilizer on it and the soil gets weaker and weaker and weaker and more and more full of the uh, problems with conventional uh, or uh, chemical fertilizers. And after a while, the soil gets depleted, the yields go down, and that soil is basically not usable for gardening anymore. And that part of the environment has really been impacted. So sustainable gardening goes the other way. We talk about building up the soil. We talk about using healthy plants. We talk about creating a a natural environment that has a lot of diversity, and we'll talk about that where it's especially helpful in reducing pests and keeping everything healthy in your garden. And <clears throat> the whole idea is to have balance. Now, balance takes a little bit more work, but it's a lot more enjoyable as a gardener in your backyard or in your local uh, food bank or your local garden. So we, we'll get into this as we go along. But everything basically starts with good soil. <clears throat> and good soil in Georgia is a hard thing to find. Okay, if you have recently bought a house, what you have, or I should say if you haven't improved your soil, this is what you have. 
It's 100% red Georgia clay. In the summer, it'll bake dry like a brick. In the winter, it'll get gooey because it holds so much water that it will actually drown your plants. The air, the roots cannot breathe because they get no air through this. So this is about the worst thing in the world for gardening. <clears throat> but like all things, it has some good news to it. Clay is full of incredible minerals that almost every plant that'll grow in the state of Georgia needs. The bad part about it is the plant can't get at it because it's all locked up in the clay, okay? So this, this is part of the composition of good soil. The other part of the composition of good soil, organic matter. This is compost that comes out of my backyard. Basically it's rotted leaves, pine straw, clippings from my shrubs, uh, peelings from my kitchen. Uh, and this, this is good stuff, but by itself, not so good. <clears throat> it's not a good fertilizer. Um, it has very little nutritive, nutritive value for plants, but this combined with Georgia red clay becomes a very wonderful soil. And this is the kind of soil that you get when you have that balance just right. You can see how, how loose this is. You can see how brown it is because of all the organic matter in it. Okay, this is the kind of stuff you want to put your plants in. So how do you take that Georgia red clay and that compost and how does it do the magic it does to create what you see on the slide on the, <clears throat> on the right <clears throat> where it has air and water and organic matter and clay? Well, the clay is that it has lots of minerals in it. The bad thing is this Soil texture is like these two pieces of wood, okay? Uh, clay is a, is a plate-shaped particle. There's very little space in there to get water, just for air to get in, or anything else. So by itself, it's lousy, okay? Well, along comes a piece of organic matter, and it gets it down there in the soil, and all of a sudden this happens. Now you have airspace and the water can get in here and air can get in here and this organic matter is prying these little plates of clay apart and allowing you to get this combination that you have on the right side of your screen. So this is all good but there's some, something even better. The organic matter <clears throat> is food for all the microbes that live in your soil. <clears throat> they eat this stuff <clears throat> and when they eat it, they give off certain acids and the acids take this clay particle and starts to decompose it. And so the de decomposing of the clay gives you the wonderful uh, of minerals that the plant will take up and will thrive. Without these microbes, this pretty much just sits here. And that's what happens in colder northern climates at during the winter, the soil goes dormant. Well, you can't, it's too cold anyway, but <clears throat> the microbes aren't doing their job. So the good news in Georgia is, you know, you can garden 12 months a year down here. The bad news in Georgia is you can garden 12 months down here. And that all depends on the microbes. You have to keep feeding these microbes so they keep breaking down the soil, releasing the minerals and the other things that your plants need. So this organic matter has to be added to the soil all the time. You cannot stop adding compost uh, to your soil if you want to have um, good yields in your garden and good healthy soil. And when you have good healthy soil, the plant is strong and then it can resist disease and it's, everything is much, much better. Oh, sorry, there we go. Okay, we talked about healthy plants. <clears throat> Naturally, a, natu a good natural environment, diversity comes from healthy soil because you can grow a lot of different things. Uh, and we'll talk about how you use natural methods to deter harmful pests a little bit later on. Okay, conventional versus sustainable. 
we talked about soil fertility and sustainable. Conventional talks about plant fertility. Conventional is reactive when it comes to pest and disease control. When you have healthy soil, you are preventing a lot of those problems and a lot of uh, attention to your garden also minimizes them. Conventional, lots of pesticides, lots of chemicals, uh, not so in sustainable gardening because by doing what we just talked about to your soil, you don't need the pesticides because you're not gonna have the bugs and you're not gonna need your, the uh, fertilizer because the soil is already providing you what you need to grow your crop. A little more planning is involved with sustainable, a little bit more loss. Uh, my dad, who had a garden since 1942 when we entered the, the Second World War, he used to call that nature's share. And it never was more than five or 10% and that was okay to him. And he never used, never used chemicals, which makes it easier to go out in the garden and eat an onion. Um, very, le very little tillage in sustainable as opposed to having to go rent your rotor tiller every day and dig up your garden, which is a lot of hard work. Um, with sustainable gardening, what you're gonna have is very loose soil. You know, we talked about this. This soil I dug up this morning, it sat for three years and I used this to get it out. So that, this is the total sum of my garden tools from my garden. It's obviously less expensive since you're not buying organic pesticides or organic uh, fertilizers. <clears throat> and a lot of this comes at a little bit of cost and time because you have to go out and you have to look at what your garden is doing. <clears throat> what I do, <clears throat> excuse me, is I go out usually with my, my afternoon uh, or my cocktail before dinner. And I walk through my garden and I look at the leaves. I look at what's growing, what's not looking too well, try to figure out what's going on, see if I have any viruses, any fungus. And you know, you can truly minimize things if you get them early. And sometimes you just rip out a plant and put in another one. And it makes it very, very simple to garden in the fall. Okay. Fall is a great time in Georgia to grow a garden. It's not hot. You don't have the huge bug load that you have in the summer. The humidity is down and all of the cool season vegetables that we'll talk about in a minute, they love the cool soil and the cool air temperatures because that's what they need to grow well. Uh, <clears throat> most of these plants will tolerate frost. Most of them actually like a little frost because it brings more sugar, especially collards. Uh, and they taste a lot sweeter uh, if you have a light frost. They are a little susceptible to drought, so you have to water frequently because their roots are pretty shallow, uh, which is different than the way you water during the summer. Warm season plants, they need the warm soil to germinate. It has to be 60 degrees or warmer. Um, what you will find out is uh, if you put your warm season vegetables in too early, they don't do well because the roots got cold. And when the roots get cold in cold soil, the plant just kind of hunkers down and doesn't take off like it should. Um, so if you're gonna plant tomatoes, make sure that the, the um, soil is good and warm before you put them in. And the warm season vegetables, obviously they will not tolerate any frost. They get the slightest amount of frost and, and they're gonna wither and die. So. Fall gardening, uh, it's a great time to be out. It's not hot. Uh, everything grows and it really does thrive and you'll love a fall vegetable garden. Okay. <clears throat> this slide, I want to draw your attention to the right-hand side, the hardy vegetables that tolerate frost. This is, these are the vegetables <clears throat> that thrive in a fall garden. Broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage collards, onions, peas, radishes, spinach, turnips. These are all your big leafy green vegetables or your big headed vegetables that love cool nights and cool soil. And this is also the stuff <clears throat> that's pretty expensive in the store. So by planting a fall garden, you can grow a lot of vegetables that taste incredibly good and I save you a lot of money. I read a, um, 
article that said out of one four foot by eight foot bed in a garden, if you do intensive gardening and you plant that and you harvest it 12 months out of the year, the cool season vegetables for the seven months where it's cool and the five, the warm vegetables for the five months it's warm, you can get about $700 worth of vegetables out of one four foot by eight foot bed. Now, <clears throat> $700 net is about $1,000 gross. So if you plant yourself a four by eight garden, you just gave yourself a thousand dollar rate. Um, that's pretty amazing when you think about it. So this stuff is extremely easy to grow and uh, you will find that it will be something that you'll have fun doing. Okay, we talked a little bit about the fact that it's cool weather in the fall and vegetables thrive in it. The picture on your screen is what happens as weather gets warm <clears throat> and cool season vegetables are exposed to the heat. That stalk that you see in the middle, that's a plant that is, is bolting. And bolting is a reaction of a plant to the fact that the weather is getting warmer and the plant is telling itself, wow, I got to hurry up and I got to reproduce. So I got to put some seeds out. And as soon as that plant starts to bolt and throw up that central stalk to make those seeds, everything in that plant changes. Taste is different. The texture of the leaves are different. Um, it'll basically be a very bitter plant and the, the reason that you're growing it disappears because it's not gonna be a delicious sugary leafy green. It's gonna be a sour bitter green because all the energy is going up for the plant. And as you can see on your screen, a lot of these things, uh, Brussels sprouts, collard, other greens, it happens as soon as the weather gets warm. But during the fall and through the winter, they love it. And you will get, you can get two, two crops of lettuce between September and end of February. Um, and that, you know, lettuce is expensive. You go to the store and, and, and buy it. Okay, preparing a plan. What I'm gonna talk about today is basically a small garden for people that are just starting out. <clears throat> There's two ways that you can plant. You can turn over the soil and that's a lot of hard work. You have to get a tiller or you have to get a shovel and you have to dig into that hard red Georgia clay uh, and you have to add a lot of organic matter to it. You can see on your why they say for new beds, you gotta add two to four inches of compost or other organic matter. You gotta get the rocks and the sticks out of it. Um, and that's a lot of hard work. And for somebody who maybe isn't even sure they wanna have a garden, maybe that's more than they wanna do. So I'm gonna present an alternative. My alternative is using a raised bed. Um, and the raised bed is basically eight to 12 inches of soil on top of whatever natural soil you have there. And what I do is I enclose it with a wood perimeter. I use pressure treated wood. Uh, some people don't like pressure treated wood, although it's not harmful to your plants. And they will use rock, uh, cinder blocks. Um, they will use um, pretty much anything they can get. But Pressure treated wood is fine. It makes a good four by eight bed because you can take an eight foot wide or eight foot long um, pressure treated plank and cut it in half and there's your four feet. And a four by eight bed, like I said earlier, you can raise about $700 worth of vegetables in it. So it's a good place to start. With a raised bed, you obviously have to fill it up. <clears throat> You've got to get that soil. So there's one or two things you can, well, one or several things you can do. You can, dig that soil out from another part of your yard and put it in there, in which case you gotta bust up a lot of red Georgia clay. You can get soil dropped off and delivered, which is pretty expensive, or you can pretty much make your own. And that's what I do. Fall vegetable gardening is wonderful because in the fall you have lots and lots of vegetable matter, or organic matter. The leaves are falling off the trees, your grass needs to be mowed, uh, a lot of your friends are taking those wonderful brown paper bags and putting all their leaves into it so they can get rid of them. Uh, well, you can take all that and you can make yourself a great raised bed out of it. 
you can take all that organic matter, the leaves, the lawn clippings, your vegetables, peelings from your kitchen, and you can put it into that, that four by eight box you just built and you stomp it down real good. And then you go to the, you know, uh, Home Depot or Lowe's or your no local nursery or whatever you want to get. And maybe you get 10 bags of potting soil for two bucks a bag. And you put that over the top for about two inches and you have a garden that you can plant. And by the next spring, all of that organic matter will have rotted down. The uh, earthworms will have gone through it and it'll have shrunk from this down about like that. But you'll have six inches of the greatest soil that you have ever seen. And so you can move that to the side the next year, put more organic matter underneath it, put it back on this side, put more organic matter, put that back, and then you've got 12 inches or as high as you wanna go <clears throat> with incredibly rich, wonderful soil. Uh, put some clay into it when you can, because you wanna have the minerals. And you have a planting bed that, since you don't walk on it, and since it's, it's all organic, it stays soft. And that's where this is all you need. Literally, I have beds at home where two years later, I take my hand and I can just go right into it and put a plant in it, just like that. And it's easy. Uh, if you have a bad back, a raised bed is good because you don't have to get down on your knees. You don't have to bend over. Uh, you can sit on the, on the edge of it and just reach in and do it. So what I have here is a little model that I made. This is what I have at home. It's a raised bed around, around the bottom, okay? It has a little vertical on each side, and there's a bar across the top. And this is great to hold on to when you, when you wanna um, you know, reach in and do some weeding, it gives you good stability. But the, the main reason that it's here is I have these hoops. And what I have at home, these are 10 foot long pieces of PVC plastic. And I just put them on the inside of the, um, the raised bed and it keeps the bow from springing out and they stay there. This, I put them in here just for demonstration. But this now becomes my little mini greenhouse for my plants during the winter. And if it gets cold, basically the only thing I do is I cover them up with a piece of plastic. Oh, hold on a second. Cover it up with a piece of plastic. And the piece of plastic I use is a nine by 12 painter's drop cloth. You can get them at any of the big box stores. And then the ends, if it's warm, I leave them open. If it's gonna freeze, I just clip them with a couple um, clothesline uh, clothespins or these little clamps that I have. And then it'll weather the frost and you open it up the next day and it works very well. And you could build this whole thing for probably 60 or $70. One four by eight bed with, with the uh, plastic to make a little mini greenhouse. You take this off in the spring when you don't need it. Um, take the, loop, the hoops out in the spring and then you've got a bed for your, for your um, summer stuff. So this is a very simple way to get going in fall planting and fall gardening. And um, it's very minimal in terms of um, you know, financial cost. And I think you really enjoy it. So think about some raised beds if you're serious about getting a, a garden. <clears throat> and I urge you to start small. Starting small, you find out whether you like it before you break your back making this huge garden and say, oh my God, this is too much work. If you, want, if you like it, you build another one and a third one or a fourth one. And then they're all manageable and you don't have to use rope tillers or anything else. It's a nice way to, to do some planting. And you don't have to worry about the soil because you've already built it and it's nice and clean. Okay. <clears throat> Organic gardening, unless you want to do it very, very well, doesn't feed your plants <clears throat> what they need. You can see from the slide, you need cottonseed meal, bone meal, kelp meal, uh, th these are all things that get very expensive. Or you can just go out and buy a bag of 10, 10, 10 fertilizer and take one big handful in this four by eight bed and sprinkle it. 
and you're pretty well done. Um, I don't go out and buy a full bag of, uh, excuse me, of fertilizer because I go to garage sales and I get a half a bag for two bucks because they just want to get rid of it. And then that's, that's fine. Uh, but, you know, 10, 10, 10 fertilizer is a good way to do it. And it, it cuts down on the amount of work you have to do as opposed to organic gardening. Again, though, this is sustainable because you're not using a lot of fertilizer. And you can see from the slide that you have heavy feeders. Some of those are your, your plants that you put in in the fall. The medium feeders, a lot of those are plants you put in the fall. And that 10, 10, 10 fertilizer will be sufficient for those plants. OK. <clears throat> this uh, presentation is getting um, put together a little late for the season. You can see on this slide, September 10th is um, a lot of the dates here. But if you have a fall garden, getting it in probably to the end of, October, end of September is, is OK, uh, especially if you do what I showed you earlier, putting a little plastic over <clears throat> your um, raised bed to make it a little bit of a mini greenhouse. That'll warm it up a little bit inside. And so you catch up if you put them in a little bit later because the temperatures will stay slightly higher uh, for the next month or two. But what you'll do if you want to do it uh, in the ground without the cover is as you can see from the um, slide, you figure out your last or rather your first frost date, which is in North Fulton, November 10th. Look at the number of days it takes to grow your crop, add a couple of weeks uh, for harvesting and germination, and then that's the day where you should put it in. Um, if you have a covered bed, like I showed you earlier, that is not that important because you'll have enough warmth to generate those, uh, germinate those seeds, and you'll have enough warmth for them to grow until the really cooler weather gets here. But <clears throat> as you can see with all of these vegetables, um, they're all fairly uh, much grouped in the same time frame, and you can put them all in pretty much together. Okay, <clears throat> for sowing seeds. A lot of seeds like beets, uh, turnips, uh, they're fairly good size. They're maybe an eighth of an inch round. So you can actually take them out of a package individually and you can drop them in a row, uh, and that's fairly easy. A lot of other ones are very small. Um, turnips and, and radishes are really tiny little seeds. They're about the diameter of a head of a pin. I don't know, three, 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 four, three, 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 very small. A couple of ways to do those. You can put them into a, a salt or pepper or a spice shaker, uh, mix them with a little bit of sand, and then just sprinkle them out. You can rip the um, package on an angle, so you have like a, a slanted um, um, edge to the package and squeeze it a little bit so you have basically a very pointed edge and you can tap that very gently and just take those things and they'll come out very slowly. You can put them in the line. Um, <clears throat> or if the things are so small that you're really not sure, you can broadcast them. You can just take them in your hand and just sprinkle them. And then as they come up, if there's too many in one place, you can take a little uh, small knife or a very small trowel and gently pry them out and just seed them out or plant them in other places. And you can literally take your finger and just stick it, make a hole and put that seedling in and then pinch it. So if there's too many in one place, you can spread them out according to what the package says. <clears throat> or if there, if there are a lot of them, then you can just thin them out and pull them out and you know, throw them away. Um, one thing I will say, don't feel like you have to use every single seed in a package. Um, a lot of times that'll result in a very crowded garden and you don't want that. You need to have uh, good space for airflow around your plants so they stay healthy, you don't get viruses. If you have extra plants, um, extra seeds, excuse me, roll them up tight in the package take a plastic or a glass jar, <clears throat> put about two inches of rice, uncooked white rice in the bottom of it because that absorbs moisture. Put your seed package in there, screw the top on real tight and put it in your refrigerator. Um, they will last two to three years. 
and they will germinate. <clears throat> this, this are, these are some collards that I germinated and this is three-year-old seed that I just took out of my refrigerator and this is enough collards for, I don't know, 50 plants and it probably is only a 50% germination but it's, it's fine. So you can save the extras and use them the next year. to mention this already you want to thin your plants to whatever the recommendation is on the seed package <clears throat> you can either cut them like the picture here is showing you or you can tease them out of the ground with a small knife i use a plastic uh, picnic knife and just tease them out and move them somewhere else it's important though that you give them the space to grow and Carrots need a couple inches between carrots, turnips probably four or five, onions four to six. Uh, and it, it's, it's fairly simple to do, you just have to go out there and get it done. But once, once they're high enough and they have several pairs of leaves, this is fairly simple to do. And hold, if you're gonna tr transplant them, hold them by the leaves, not the stem, because if you break the stem, the plant's gone. If you happen to pull off a leaf, they'll grow another one. So if you're gonna transplant them, always do it using holding the leaves. Okay, planting transplants. A Couple of things here I, I want to mention. You can buy um, your plants uh, and they sell a whole variety of them at all the nurseries and the big box stores. If you're gonna buy plants, <clears throat> I recommend two things. First, take one of the plants and pop it out of the, the container that it's in and look at the roots. The picture you have on the upper right shows on the right hand side a plant that has a nice healthy root system. The roots are silver or white. They are separated widely. That's a good healthy plant. But the plant on the left, you can see those roots are much more matted. They're brown. There's a good indication, that's a good indication that plant is not very healthy, might even have some disease. And you can see the picture on the bottom, all that white is roots. That, that plant has been in that pot way too long. I wouldn't buy that plant because it's gotten used to growing tight. Even if you try to tease the roots out, they don't thrive. So look for another one that has less um, <clears throat> matted roots. And um, it's, that's what they call being root bound and it, plants don't do well if you buy them that way. The other thing is look at the leaves. If the leaves are green, uh, they don't have any edges that are brown or wilted. They don't have any um, holes in them. That's a healthy plant. That's what you wanna take into your garden. You don't wanna take into your garden something that might have a disease and then you spread it to everything else. Any place that you buy your plants should not object to you popping a couple plants out of their, their containers and looking at them. Um, that's just, no, that's how you know you're getting your money's worth. Okay, well, let me, let me back up one thing. Okay. The other thing you can do is you can raise your own seedlings. <clears throat> this is a, cake tin that I bought at the grocery store. It comes with a wonderful plastic cover on it. And they come two to a pack for about a buck and a half. It's the best little greenhouse in the whole world. You can fill this up with, well, first thing you do is you punch a whole bunch of holes in the bottom of it. You fill it up with potting soil. You put your seeds in according to the directions on the plant uh, package. You put the cover on it. You put that on your windowsill. If it's really bright, direct sun, maybe put a piece of paper over it so you don't really cook them. And then once they sprout, <clears throat> they will start to grow. <clears throat> and you'll see things like this. And as these get a little bit bigger, what I'll do is I'll tease these things out with my knife and put them in a separate little two inch or four inch pots and let them grow to about that big and then they'll go out in the garden. So you can do start doing these anytime. And 
I started these about a week ago because I knew it was getting late to get them out. And I'll probably hold them in here another week and then I'll put them out in the garden. And when you put them out in the garden, you have to kind of introduce them slowly to the outside, maybe put them in your garage overnight for a couple nights so they get used to cooler temperatures, and then you can put them out in the garden. Wow. They're very easy to water. What you do is you get a bigger plant and a bigger uh, pan, rather. And since this had holes in the bottom, you fill this up with water to the height of this. And you just put this in here and let it soak for about five minutes, take it out, let it drain. That way you don't hurt the young plants by hitting them with a stream of water and they do very, very well. Okay, maintenance. Not so much in the fall because your, your garden temperatures and your soil temperatures are cool, but especially in the summer, mulching is an absolutely critical thing to do. It benefits your fall garden just as much as your summer garden, mainly by conserving moisture. You don't have to water as much. And since your fall vegetables are shallow rooted, that helps. It prevents weeds, um, means less work for you. And it moderates soil temperatures. Roots are very, very funny things. <clears throat> they get too hot, they stop growing. They get too cold, they stop they get soaked in a lot of water, they drown because they can't breathe. About half of the air that a plant takes in for photosynthesis comes out of the soil through the roots. A lot of people don't know that. So if the roots aren't operating on, at maximum efficiency, you don't have a good yield on your garden. You wanna keep good mulch on your garden, two, four inches um, if you use biodegradable stuff, it improves your soil over time. <clears throat> you wanna keep it thick so you prevent the weeds from coming up. You wanna keep it away from the plant slightly because you don't wanna have rot. If, if the stalk of a plant has a lot of um, mulch around it, it stays wet and that, prov that provokes a lot of mildew and a lot of rot and so we'll have problems. But keep it a couple inches away <clears throat> and the plant will be very happy. Weeding, I don't know about you, weeding I hate. So I mulch very religiously <clears throat> and it's just a lot easier and your garden looks really nice uh, and you're feeding your soil at the same time. Okay, what can you use for mulch? I use compost, um, that's the stuff I showed you earlier. That's this stuff, it's just organic matter that has kind of semi-rotted. Uh, this will get, you know, rotted down further and add to my topsoil. <clears throat> the um, earthworms will come up and eat it and take it back down as they make their tunnels. It's um, very, very good. It really helps your soil and looks nice. You can use pine straw. Uh, it stays, it has a very high loft, so it'll keep a lot of the sun away from the ground. So it will really cut down on um, uh, weeds. Uh, it will not get soggy because it again has a good loft. And if you have vegetables that need a higher pH that are more acid loving, um, that's good for, for acid loving plants. Also, you can use leaves. They're free. Uh, we talked about using those to fill up your raised bed. Uh, they do give you some nutrients. I think compost, if I remember right, which is mainly rotted leaves, is like 0.5, 0.5, 0.5, and uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Uh, it's, it's beneficial, but it doesn't have as enough. <clears throat> you wanna shred them um, so they stay down, they don't blow away, but don't mount them down too much because they can become soggy. Uh, if they do that, you need to fluff them a little bit with a rake or, or a hoe and, and keep that loft. You want about three or four inches of loft. You can use pine bark. Uh, pine bark is very good. It lasts a long time. It looks good. Uh, the small stuff, the, I think they call them mini nuggets. They're very uh, effective. Um, they will though, as they rot, take nitrogen out of your garden. So I would add a little bit of extra fertilizer, a little bit of extra nitrogen if you're gonna use pine bark, just so <clears throat> uh, your plants aren't deprived of that nitrogen when they are um, trying to grow. 
You can also use coffee grounds. Um, you will find out that earthworms love coffee grounds. If you put them out in your garden, maybe eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch thick, you come back in two days and they're gone because earthworms come up and they eat them and they go back down and they mix them with your soil. <clears throat> Probably none of us have enough to really cake them, you know, an inch thick or so. If you do that, they will cake and they'll get very hard. Um, and that is, is not that good because they, they, they will also shrink when you do that. I love newspaper. Basically any kind of paper that is not that glossy coated stock like uh, magazines um, does becomes excellent mulch in the garden. It's really great if you shred it, uh, especially the uh, photocopy paper. Um, the nice part about shredded paper is it, it keeps that loft, the water goes through it, and since it's white, it reflects the sun up onto the underside of the, the leaves of your vegetables, which makes them grow better because they have more energy. <clears throat> it occasionally will blow away, but if you grind it, or not grind it, if you shred it, it, it once it, it mats with a little bit of a rain or your, your first watering, it doesn't blow away too much. Uh, if you don't like the appearance of it, you can put it uh, under regular organic mulch uh, to get the loft that you want to two to four inches. I just put it on my garden white and the plants seem to love it. Uh, one caution, if you want to use straw or hay, it does contain a lot of weed seed. So the stuff that you get from the big box stores, um, you really don't know what's in it. They've just commercially harvested it. Uh, if you have to protect your, your vegetables because you're going to have a hard freeze, straw or hay is very good. You can kind of mound it up close to the um, plants. And then when the freeze is um, over with, you can spread it back out and it'll protect your um, vegetables against any frost damage. But lots of things that you can use for, um, for mulch. Okay, wood chips, again, like uh, pine bark nuggets, <clears throat> they're very good, uh, they're cheap. You can get them delivered to your driveway if you want a whole truckload of them. I uh, wouldn't recommend that unless you have a very, very big garden. Uh, I've never run into cocoa shells in Georgia, but uh, that's here. Uh, sawdust is like uh, coffee grinds. It uh, does tend to cake a little bit, but if you can get it, especially if it's old stuff and partly rotted, it's very good soil amendment. It will rot out and help your soil. Corn cobs are pretty much now used uh, commercially, so they're very hard to get. <clears throat> Personally, I don't like black plastic film uh, because after a while it, it degrades and that plastic gets into your soil. And I'm, I'm a more of an organic gardener, so I, I don't like plastic in my soil. <clears throat> Peanut shells, I don't know if you can get them around here or not. I guess maybe in bags at the box stores or in nursery, but uh, they're not recommended because they take too much uh, nutrients out of the soil, kind of like the wood chips and the um, pine bark nuggets. So it, they're hard to find, so I wouldn't use them anyway. Okay, if you have a small garden, a small plot, Crop rotation isn't all that important, <clears throat> but the point I'd like to make here is that bugs get used to the fact that you plant the same thing in the same place year after year after year. They know where to look for their food. So if you move their food, they basically go away because they can't find it. <clears throat> this is especially true with things that live in the soil. <clears throat> Sometimes, but not so much it is true for flying uh, uh, insects that come onto your uh, plants as moths or um, lay their eggs. But also crop rotation is very good because the same plant in the same place takes the same amount or not the, the same kinds of minerals out of your soil. So slowly, if it's in the one spot, what that plant needs is going to be used up. And unless you take all of the uh, plant parts that you don't use and put them back in the soil, you're not going to be improving that soil with that plant needs. If you move it to another place, that soil has a chance to regenerate, which you'll be putting compost in it or another um, kind of crop that will take different minerals. And by moving it around in your garden, 
the soil a lot healthier. <clears throat> and you can see from your slide, these crops come in different plant families. So just make sure you try to move them around. Now, if you only have one four by eight raised bed, this is not so easy to do, but you know, you can move it a couple feet. If you have a problem with a soil pest or the soil gets worn out, it's pretty, pretty simple to take that soil out of that raised bed. You can spread it on your lawn wherever you need to have a little bit of top dressing and put some new soil in there or make some new soil with um, the leaves and a little bit of soil on top like we talked about a little bit earlier. Okay, one of the big parts of sustainable gardening is what we call integrated pest management. This is basically keeping a healthy environment so nature keeps the balance between the healthy insects and the bad insects and the healthy things and the bad things. <clears throat> There's a lot of ways to do this. The first one is maintain good healthy soil. We talked about what that was. Make sure it's the right pH, which is the level of acidity or alkalinity of your soil. That first and foremost determines whether those microbes that are eating all of that organic matter and leasing all those minerals are gonna be able to do their job. They, they exist in a very narrow range of pH. If the pH goes either way, those microbes, the population dies back, plants don't have as much to get, so they don't do as well. <clears throat> you wanna have enough water on your plants, they say an inch a week. Um, <clears throat> Plants don't like it when they, have, when they get shocked. If they have less water, they're gonna go into shock, they're gonna get weak, and weak plants attract pests, and pests can get at them a lot easier. Talked about crop rotation. Sanitation is basic. You know, keep, your, keep your beds um, cleaned out. Keep your um, plants spaced apart so they have good air flow, and mulch it, and water it, and you, what, you, what you have there is a very healthy environment <clears throat> for your plants to live in. So what happens if you do start getting some pests? Well, a couple things you can do. The picture on your screen is a row cover. Basically all it is is a physical barrier that prevents flying insects from flying in on your crops and laying their eggs and then they become larvae or caterpillars that eat the crop, the crop that you're trying to grow. You can do that. <clears throat> you can go out in your garden. You can actually pick things off your, um, your plants. We have a slide coming up about cabbage loopers. We'll show you that. It's a big caterpillar about that long. You can pick them off. You can put out traps. <clears throat> you can put out lures. Um, in the summer, you can kill bugs in your soil by putting a clear plastic uh, tarp down and letting that soil cook the temperature will get up about 140 degrees and that'll kill a lot of stuff. In the winter, you can just let your soil freeze. That also kills a lot of things. And if you have either two-legged or four-legged creatures, good tight fencing is um, keep them out of your garden. <clears throat> okay, biological controls. Nature balances itself. So if you have one kind of a pest, there is something that'll eat that pest. Only about 3% of all the 35,000 different species of bugs in Georgia are bad for your garden. The rest are beneficial or um, neutral. So the one thing you don't wanna do is wipe out your garden with pesticide and kill everything because that is not an environmentally balanced situation. Then anything can come in and it's a free for all. So you wanna attract Beneficial insects, you want to use chemicals as a last resort. How do you attract <clears throat> beneficial insects? One thing you can do is, as part of your garden, plant flowers. Uh, zinnias are very easy to plant. They grow very well. Uh, they attract lots of pollinators. They, and pollinators, like uh, moths and butterflies, attract birds. And birds eat everything. Uh, they love bugs. You can, you can introduce your own bugs like praying mantis, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Or ladybugs, 
you can actually buy them and they will eat everything in your garden that they like and will stay around until the food's gone then they'll probably move on chemicals are really a last resort because like i said chemicals kill everything and that's that's not a sustainable way to manage your garden okay here's an example of aphids aphids come into your garden fairly easily you can see them on the bottom sides of your plant there's those little brown and white spots um, they're easy to take off you can hit them with water and they'll fall on the ground they don't get back up on your plants if a, if a leaf is heavily infested just pull it off and throw it in a bucket of soapy water and that'll kill them you can put row covers on you can bring in your own uh, other insects that'll eat them or you can spray them with insecticidal soap which basically um, chokes them a little bit, makes them move. And you can use um, laundry, uh, uh, dishwashing detergent, a couple of teaspoons in about a gallon of water in a sprayer, and you can spray them and they'll move on. Very simple to control these things. Here's the cabbage looper I talked about earlier. <clears throat> this is a, about that long. If you look at them, you can see them. You basically just pick them off. Throw them in a bucket of soapy water, they'll die. Or if you have uh, chickens with in your uh, garden, chickens love them. And you'll make a very lot, lot of happy chickens. Simplest ways to pick them off, you can spray with um, something called Bt, which is a uh, bacteria. It's Bacillus thuringiensis. I'm not sure the pronunciation is right. That bacteria gets into their stomachs and it basically messes up their ability to eat and they die. Um, not toxic and not harmful for anything else in the environment, or you can just keep them off your plants with row covers like we talked about on other ones. Okay. Pesticides are good, bad, or horrible depending on how you use them. Please note there are three warning levels. Caution is low toxicity, warning is moderate toxicity, danger is very high. Personally, I will not use anything that says danger. And I would caution you, if you think pesticides are the way to go, <clears throat> read all the directions, because they spent a lot of time figuring them out. If they tell you to wear clothing, wear everything they tell you to wear. Wash your clothes as soon as you're done. Do all the other instructions. And by all means, don't use more. But more can be very, very bad. <clears throat> so read it, know how to use it, and use it according to what they tell you to use. Okay, in Georgia, pretty much you can garden all the way through the winter. Starting in September, putting in your cold crops, they will grow pretty much until February, March, <clears throat> when you start putting in your warm season crops. If you want to have things that are a little bit tender, like lettuce, we, we had a, an example of a little mini greenhouse I showed you earlier. These row covers are very good. They will protect against frost. They'll give you about a six or eight, or eight degree increase in the temperature underneath them. They let, it, let in about 90% of the light. So that's a very good alternative. Um, you can see on your screen some other options, plastic milk jugs with the bottom cut out, make great little cloches for individual plants. Uh, you can use plastic over hoops, but if it's non-breathable, make sure you take it off. There's just a lot of ways to do this, and it's very simple, uh, very cheap, and it'll get your garden through really bad areas of frost or cold snaps. Okay. End of season is basically in Georgia just preparing for the next season. <clears throat> we don't have a winter overlay or you know, that you have up north where nobody gardens from November through what, April, I guess. Uh, that's when you get ready to put in your new stuff for this year, because as I said, you can garden 12 months out of the year down here. But you wanna clean out everything that is in your um, garden. Make sure you're not putting stuff that has disease in your compost pile. Take it out off site, throw it in the trash. Add a lot of organic matter to your, um, to your garden. If you've been composting, you can take that and put it in. If, if you wanna turn your soil over, and get that composting underneath. You can do that, not necessary if, you're, if you haven't been walking on it because it's still gonna be very loose. Um, 
And if you want to, you can plant a cover crop, but that has to come up in the spring and some of those are pretty hard to do. If you have a small garden, it's probably not worth it. What you can do is grow peas or beans in the spring and take all of the that um, plant and bury that because that'll really grow uh, the, or increase the amount of nitrogen in your soil. And th then you also get a crop out of it because <clears throat> sugar snap peas or peas are delicious, especially the sugar snaps early in the spring. Um, and then you just bury the rest of it and you have nitrogen that's been put back in your soil. So it's a very simple process to go along. It's not hard. If you start small with one raised bed, you can see whether you like it. You can see if it's something that you want to continue. You can build more beds. You can make them higher so it's easier on your back. There's a lot of stuff you can do. And one of the nice things about gardening in Georgia is 12 months out of the year, you can get involved with it whenever you want. <clears throat> Once a year, you should at least test your soil. You can see on your screen this little soil bag. <clears throat> this is a a bag that you take to the Cooperative Extension Office and for $8, they will give you a report and you'll get it online. And it'll tell you what you need to do to that soil to make it really perfect for the kinds of crops that you wanna grow. You tell them what you wanna grow and they will tell you what's missing, what to add. Uh, and it's a great way every couple of years to make sure that you have real good, healthy soil. It's very simple to take these things you get one of those bags, you dig a couple inches down into the root zone of where your, your roots are gonna be. You take five or six or seven or eight uh, samples in your garden, put them in a clean paper bag, mix them all up real good, put about a half a cup in that bag and take that to the office and then you are uh, ready to go and they will tell you online in probably a couple of weeks what you need to do. And it's either lime to raise the pH, sulfur to reduce it, and you get that soil in the right zone so that all those microbes are happy and they're really making all of that good uh, release of all those minerals. And the <clears throat> plants are in the right zone, so they're very happy to take them up and you have good healthy plants, a lot less bugs and much better crops. Uh, we, we just talked about the peas. Um, Keep your, one thing I would recommend, <clears throat> keep your gardening tools clean. Uh, every now and then dip them in a bleach solution so you're not transferring any kind of disease with them. Um, scrub them off with a wire brush, uh, spray them with a little bit of oil or wipe some vegetable oil on them that keeps the rust down. Keep them inside so the wood, the wood handles don't rot out. <clears throat> and that's pretty much all you need to do. One word of warning, seed catalogs are very dangerous. You get them in January and you start looking through them and pretty soon you've ordered 40 you know, boxes of seed or plant uh, packages and you don't have anywhere near that amount of space in your garden. So word of caution, just plant what you th think you can grow and, and don't get carried away because I do it every year. Okay, <clears throat> we're gonna run through some vegetables here real quick. Collards. Great fall plant. Uh, they grow very easily. You can put them in now. Uh, they will have a great taste if they get a little frost. Just a good basic green and probably one of the best greens you can have for vitamins. Here's turnips. Turnips are a root vegetable. You can literally sow the seeds <clears throat> and um, some of the newer varieties, the the root tastes like an apple, they're nice and sweet, and the turnip greens are very nutritious. You can use the whole plant, very easy to grow in the winter. Beets, pretty much the same. Um, the greens are very good, and the <clears throat> beets themselves, you boil them, and if you want a real easy tip to take the skins off, get a piece of newspaper and just take that newspaper and roll it around that beet, and all the skin comes right off, you rinse the beet, and you don't have to peel it, it's very easy. And they taste great with a little bit of butter. Brussels sprouts I've never grown, um, but they are easy to grow in the fall. Uh, they will hold up to a frost, and if you like Brussels sprouts, um, they're very easy to grow in the garden. Broccoli. Broccoli can go in now or later uh, in almost the end of winter. Uh, 
they will head up very well. Uh, they need a lot of organic matter in the soil, but easy to grow. You put them in, water them, keep a little mulch around them, and they will, they will do very, very well for you. Cauliflower, pretty much um, the same as broccoli. They are easy to grow. Good head vegetable, they, they will head up nice. Uh, and <clears throat> just make sure that uh, you give them enough water and pretty easy to grow. Beans, very, very fast, direct sow them. They grow pretty much uh, out of the ground and very simple, no maintenance for them and uh, just harvest them out. Peas, same thing, um, put them in the ground, they will grow up a trellis and you can have them probably in 45 to 60 days. I've never done pumpkins because pumpkins are so cheap to buy and they take so much space that with a small garden, <clears throat> I don't think it's worth the money. But you can try it if you like. They are very easy to, uh, to grow. You put them, pretty much put them in and, and they just grow, that vine just grows. Radishes, very quick to grow. When you take something else out, you can put a couple of radish seeds in, you can grow them in little small clumps, uh, four weeks and there's probably 10 different kinds, so you can get whatever kind you like. Uh, they're great for, for winter vegetables um, and winter salads, <clears throat> and very, very easy to grow. Your kids will love them because they see it right away. I've had no luck growing carrots in Georgia. I've given up. I don't know what I do. I don't do well, so I'll just let you read this slide, and I can't offer you any advice because they won't grow for me, and I've tried everything. I'm a northern gardener. We plant carrots differently up there, and I just haven't found a secret. So if any, any of you know, let me know. Lettuce, spinach, love cool weather. They don't, they don't bolt. They don't, um, they don't get bitter. You can put them in now. You can put them in late winter, early spring. Uh, they do need some light, so very uh, lightly uh, seed them on top. Um, 60 to 90 days, and you'll have all the lettuce you want in the, in the winter garden. Onions and leeks, again, put them in from seed. They grow in about 90 days. Um, very easy to grow. You can take them out whenever you need them. Uh, the uh, bunching onions, you can, will grow all year long down here. I'm sorry, all winter long, and you have your salads whenever you want. Never grown parsnips, but they do very well in cold weather, and they actually like frost. So that's a kind of a bulletproof winter, winter um, vegetable. Kohlrabi, I don't know anything about. Um, it grows fairly quickly. A lot of people like it for salads, but I, I just don't know anything about the vegetable. As celery, I don't know a thing about this. <clears throat> they say it's very tasty. I've never tasted it, but it will grow very quickly, very well down here. So if that's something that you have a uh, uh, appetite for, uh, by all means, put it in your fall garden. Okay, I wanna to close today with some references. On your screen is a UGA Publications website. You can see www.caes.uga.edu-publications. That's the College of Agriculture and Environmental Sciences at the University of Georgia. And on that website, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> is about 5,000 publications that cover anything that has to do with agriculture or horticulture in the state of Georgia, from a small backyard garden to a thousand acre farm. There's everything there that you want. It's free. All you have to do is go in there. It's very easy to search. Uh, so if you want something for Georgia, it's probably right there in that screen. If you have one gardening book you want to buy, I would recommend the Southern Living Gardening Book. It's very complete. It's only for the Southeast US. Uh, and it really does a very good job presenting vegetables, shrubs, flowers, trees. Uh, so it's a complete garden book and very, very easy to read and understand and, and very complete for our area. Obviously, there's Google. But I'd like to also mention at the end of this, all of these classes that we have are online at our northfultonmastergardener.net 
website. Um, there are probably seven or eight different classes. I think they're on the next slide. Uh, nope. Uh, but oh, here, this is it right here. <clears throat> you can see um, that, uh, well, no, I take it back. It's not right here. Let me go back here a second. Yep. Sorry about this. Still trying to get there. Okay. We have classes on um, lawn maintenance, on annuals, on container gardening, um, roses, pruning, several other ones. And they're all online. You can get, get to them whenever you want. And if we don't have coronavirus and, and uh, COVID-19, we have, you know, classes that we actually teach in, in uh, uh, real time with real people. And so those, will, when we start up again, they'll be listed here as well. And you can have a presentation like I'm doing right now, except you can come and ask questions and have it live. Okay, now, Master Gardeners. Basically, we are a volunteer group of people who work with the University of Georgia and the Cooperative Extension Service in Georgia. <clears throat> and we take and distribute information on gardening and horticulture to the general public. UGA is a land grant college, so they have a mandate that they have to do agricultural research and disseminate that to uh, people in the state of Georgia. The way they do that is through the uh, Cooperative Extension Service and each county in the state of Georgia has a Cooperative Extension agent. It's their job to answer the questions for people that are in the agricultural business or to homeowners who want some information about gardening. We are simply a volunteer organization that assists the Cooperative Extension agent and in exchange for an excellent education that we get that takes 14 weeks eight hours a day, one day a week. Uh, we volunteer, we agree to give them 25 hours a year of our time. And believe me, all of us love gardening so much, we probably give three or four times that. <clears throat> but it's our job to help the UGA and the Cooperative Extension Agent provide gardening education and disseminate gardening information to the state of Georgia. So that's what we do. Future classes, you will see that they are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can go to our webpage and get a listing. As I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> when we can get back to online or real life, real time classes, there'll be in, in, uh, people actually teaching classes. You can come and ask your questions. Um, and we do this as a public service, so it's all free to you. And I think with that, I think we are done, yes. Well, I wanna thank you all for being uh, with me today. I hope I have given you some information that you will find useful. And I think that you will enjoy our other classes as well. So I invite you to go online and look at some of the other ones. So thank you for your attention and I hope you have a good time in your garden.